I want to welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome to the California Drought Funding Webinar. This is a joint effort by the California State Water Resource Control Board and the Department of Water Resources. So what is the purpose of this workshop? So the main idea is to provide information about drought funding that has become available in this year's budget. Uh, we are going to explain the eligibility and how the funding will work, how people can put in and get information on how to secure funding for their different drought projects. And then we also want to answer questions, give some people some one on one time. And we have the chat function. Um, that is how we'll be collecting the questions. We're using the chat button in Zoom. It's the little balloon with chat. Um, we will focus on answering the questions toward the end of this webinar around 1030, give or take some time. So if you have a question, feel free to you know type it in and we will address it probably later on. So just talking about our agenda today, we have several presentations. My name is Samuel Miller. I work with the Department of Water Resources. Um, I'm working as a facilitator today. We have uh, Matt Nolberg and Megan Tosney from the State Water Resource Control Board. They're gonna be giving us a welcome and introduction and just talking about um, this is an overall view of the programs going on and whatnot and their activities with the drought. Then we have Steve Doe from Department of Water Resources. He's going to be speaking about the Small Communities Drought Relief Program that the Department of Water Resources is facilitating. Then we're going to be moving on to Ashley Gilry with the Department of Water Resources. She's going to be speaking on the basics for urban community and multi-benefit drought funding programs. Then we're also gonna be working with Matt Pavelchuk from the State Water Resource Control Board. He'll be speaking about the State Water Board drought funding and more funding opportunities. Um, I, I, Sam Miller was gonna speak a little bit about the CFCC fairs coming up. That's a separate event that's coming up in the next month. Um, and then also we have Ron Miller from Cal OES and he's going to be here giving some information on Cal OES programs as well related to FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Assistance Grant funding. So with that, I will turn it over to Matt Nolberg, and he's going to give us a nice welcome this morning. So thank you, Sam. Um, good morning. And and thanks to everybody for attending this event. And thank you to all the folks who worked to put this together. Um, as uh, Sam mentioned, my name is Matt Nolberg and I'm part of the Department of Water Resources Drought Response Core Team. Uh, as you're all aware, drought is here. Um, we're experiencing our second consecutive dry year and, and those early warm temperatures um, that likely induced by climate change in conjunction with our very dry soils have depleted the amount of runoff water we would typically expect from our snowpack. So of course, this has resulted in really historic reductions in the amount of water flowing to our reservoirs and stream systems. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, soil conditions were so dry this spring that in much of the snow melt, which is critical to filling our reservoirs, uh, was absorbed before it even reached, you know, the, the, the usual streams and tributaries, and and our runoff was 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 even lower than average than the precipitation. So, to date, um, Governor Newsom has proclaimed a drought emergency in 50 out of 58 counties, and uh, as a response to this, um, hundreds of millions of dollars have been allocated to, to, to drought mitigation and, and budgeted to mitigate its effects. Um, so Department of Water Resources is administering approximately $500 million of this funding. And currently we're looking at uh, within the department, 100 uh, or 95 million uh, going towards uh, urban community drought relief. 
200 million going towards multi-benefit drought relief and uh, 190 million going towards small community drought leave relief. And, and a few notes, of, you know, especially about the small community drought relief that, that I'd like to mention is that the, the department is, is proactively working on ensuring portions of this funding will be allocated to disadvantaged and underrepresented communities, as well as to tribal governments and, and their communities. Um, tribal governments are eligible applicants as specified in the guidelines for this uh, small community drought relief program. Um, so you wanna note that there's no formal solicitation and you'll hear more about this in the presentation for the, the $190 million worth of small relief, small system relief programs and um, th that uh, you know we recognize that the tribal governments and tribal communities are impacted and, and we encourage them to apply um, as soon as possible. Uh, in addition, we're also putting together a similar workshop as today that's directed towards tribal communities and, and we're looking to, to have this take place in October. Um, so thank you very much for, for tuning in and, and I'd like to send things over for a, for a further welcome to Megan Tosney at the State Water Resources Control Board. Thank you. Um, good morning, I'm Megan Tosney. I am the Assistant Deputy Director of our Office of Sustainable Water Solutions in the Board's Division of Financial Assistance. Um, I think Matt covered a lot of the important updates already, so just want to reiterate a quick welcome to the folks tuning in and also a big thank you to staff for, you know, not just putting this meeting together, but also great ongoing work to coordinate drought funding between the two agencies. Um, I did want to, one thing to mention that I don't think was already covered was that we recently had some workshops about opportunities to fund countywide drought assistance programs that conclude a range of assistance types for water systems and households within that county. And we wanna to continue to encourage representatives from counties to pursue those opportunities. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that again today, but we also, you know, of course, plan to cover drought funding sources a little more broadly to help make other local entities and water systems, you know, aware of, um, like Matt said, a lot of new resources that are available. So, um, yeah, I just, I hope you find some opportunities that are good fit for your needs and I'll turn it back to Sam to start the presentations. Thanks. Okay, thank you both. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Megan. Um, so first on deck, we have Steve Doe. He is um, in charge of the Small Community Drought Relief Program. So if you're ready, Steve, take it away. Oh, thank you, Matt. Um, just give me a minute here. Oh, thank you, Sam. And um, once again, I want to welcome all of you and um, tell you how really excited I am to uh, uh, speak briefly, hopefully, about the Small Community Drought Relief Program. We think this is a great opportunity to help small communities all over uh, the state. So today I'll be talking um, a little bit about the drought relief funding and our uh, small community drought relief program objectives. Then I'll talk about who is eligible for it. Talk a little bit about the funding, the funding available and then how to apply. And uh, if you have questions, I will show you the resource by which you can uh, get your uh, questions answered speedily. And um, as by way of um, introduction, I'm the program manager for this small community drought relief program. So as uh, Matt Nolbeck said earlier on, the governor and the legislature move really quickly because as as soon as the year started it was obvious that we were in a drought based on all the hydrological conditions so the budget act contained about 500 million dollars 
for drought relief, of which um, 200 here went, uh, is supposed to be going to small community drought, which I'll be speaking about. My uh, colleague, Ashley, also within the Department of Water Resources, will be speaking about the, the $100 million total that's going to urban drought, as well as the $200 million that's going for multi-benefit. So my, once again, my, um, my coverage is for the small community drought relief program. So what are our program objectives? It's really important to understand what it is we are trying to do here so that when you apply, you'll be very targeted in, in how um, you, you make your application. The program's objective is to provide immediate and near-term financial and or technical support. And this is to help small communities. So that means that we are not entertaining applications from private individuals. It's to help communities. And uh, by communities, we are not being too uh, technical. We are talking about in groups of people. And I'll go a little bit more into um, eligibility. So the program objectives have kind of been divided into two. So the first one targets immediate and temporary measures. For instance, if you are out of water and you need water immediately to help you uh, deal with this drought, yes, you can apply to us, usually through a county program. And uh, we are looking at uh, haul water, water tanks, bottled water, and also emergency um, water in ties to the next utility that may be able to help you. So these are all temporary measures supposed to tie you over so that we can help with a near-term and resilient infrastructure. So with uh, infrastructure, we are looking at water supply sources, uh, be it uh, a new well or be it um, maybe a uh, surface water. Uh, we're looking at uh, water system storage, like water tanks for the distribution system. And if you have leaking, aging and leaking pipelines that are losing lots of water, we certainly want to deal with that. We don't want people losing water during this drought. And then uh, also we provide a backup uh, generator for water system operation. And this is really important because if you have a great water system and you don't have backup power to be able to operate it, uh, it's almost as if you don't even have one. So we are including this in our um, in what we are providing. So who is eligible to apply? So this is a list of uh, the organizations that are eligible to apply to us. And these include uh, public agencies and utilities, and uh, mutual water companies, nonprofits, and the tribes as well. So these are eligible to apply. And the fact that um, an organization is eligible to apply does not make the organization the beneficiary per se. So we do have a demarcation to show what the uh, beneficiary communities are. And we are defining uh, small communities that are eligible for this program as those communities that are not uh, supplied by an urban water supplier uh, based on the California Water Code. And somebody will say, oh, who's an urban water supplier? And indeed, we've received uh, this question many times. So if you are a utility that supplies what 3,000 connections or more, or more than 3,000 acre feet per year, you are classified as an urban water supplier. Now, this is just a cutoff point just to, to show who can apply to the small community drought program or the urban. Now, if, if you are an urban water supplier, you just apply to the um, urban program, which uh, Ashley will be talking about uh, pretty soon. Uh, but however, let's say, 
you are not too sure, it, you know, after all the explanations and whatnot, you're still not sure. If you apply to my program and we determine that uh, you don't qualify, but you do qualify for the Airman program, we will forward your application to the Airman program. So don't worry about this. And one other thing that's very different, you know, with this um, program is that we are not running it like some of the proposition uh, grant programs that we normally run, whereby you there's a, uh, a guideline and a solicitation package that goes out, and then um, it's competitive. So it behooves you to have a complete package. And um, these applications are opened, analyzed, and if you are not selected, good luck. And those who are selected, you know, the lucky ones, you know, get um, an agreement, etc. No, that's not how we run in this. We realize that many of the communities out there may not even be in a position to be able to make application themselves. So if we are contacted by any organization, we proactively work with them to make sure that their project is, is uh, tailored, if they are an uh, eligible entity, is tailored so as to be able to meet um, our guidelines. So there's a lot of back and forth. So having said that, if an organization applies to us and their application you know, is complete and detailed enough, we're able to move on it really quickly. But if it's not detailed enough, then there's a, lot, a little bit of back and forth in order to be able um, to get the application to a point where we can actually fund it. So we've had, we've had many questions about, oh, what is eligible? Uh, what kind of costs are eligible? And uh, we're looking at reasonable cost of studies, engineering design and uh, project uh, construction and other work related project costs. And um, some of these include, you know, land acquisition, et cetera. So now this is where it gets a little bit tricky because, you know, some will come, some uh, come to us and say, oh, I want to purchase an acre for a water storage tank. And we say, oh, that sounds reasonable. And then some also approach us and say, oh, I want to buy 100 acres. Now, wait a minute. You, you can tell straight away 100 acres, you know, for our needs. It's, it's not really, you know, what we are trying to do here. So in this case, the program will determine what is needed for the project, and we will fund that part of it. Because at the end of the day, we have to be accountable for every bit of funding we put out there. So we work, we do work with you in order to make sure that um, uh, things are done properly and speedily so that um, uh, help can get to those who need it. So when you are sending us your, uh, your proposal, uh, be as detailed as possible. However, of course, we don't want a thesis either. So these are some of the things you, know, you should uh, uh, provide. Actually, these are in our guidelines. So provide a description, a, doc, uh, a discussion, and the documentation, and provide enough detail so that we can be able to make a, a, a determination as to whether this qualifies or does not. And when you tell us that, OK, I want to construct a water system improvement, and um, I want to add a, a new well, and I I want to add a water tank and I want to add what pipelines, et cetera. And then you tell us, oh, and I want to do this for what, $3 million. Now, if this is not broken up, it's very difficult for us to tell whether you have underestimated or overestimated it. So give us details, give, give us the, the supporting document that show how you arrive at your number. So this cuts down yeah, quickly on the amount of work that needs to be done in order to be able to uh, get funding speedily to you. 
Now, before applying, I'd really encourage you to go out there to our website, which is uh, listed here. If for some reason you do not remember, just type a uh, small community drought relief program into any search engine, and you should be able to get a link to be able to click and get to the guidelines. Read it completely, because sometimes we get questions that we realize that if uh, those asking the questions had read the guidelines, they would already know. So read the guidelines completely. And if still after that, you have questions, you can contact us. And after the guidelines, you can complete your application. You need to get us an application. If you send us a preliminary engineering report, we cannot give you funding based on a preliminary engineering report, even though that would be a good supporting document for your funding. So send, do send us an application and do it sooner rather than later, because this is on a first come first serve basis. We have uh, $200 million. However, there are about 190 that is actually available for funding and already um, about 40 million have already been um, uh, committed so far. So how do you submit your application? I mentioned now this on a first come first serve basis. Uh, however, because of the Budget Act, you need to get this to us by December uh, 29, 2023. That's if you wait. But the thing is, that if you're really in a drought and you really do need help, you want to do this really quickly. We prefer electronic applications and send it to the small community drought uh, at water.ca.gov. Uh, However, if for some reason you are unable to send an like electronic uh, copy, you can always send us a hard copy. We'll entertain that as well. And if you have any questions, uh, you can always call Alina. Alina is one of my staff, and uh, she's already been fielding questions from many of you. And uh, you can contact her uh, via email, which is our best preference here. However, if your question is a little bit convoluted and you think a conversation will be a better way to uh, access that, then by all means, we want to encourage you, you can, you can give a call. And uh, with that, I think uh, questions are being taken at the end of all the presentation. So I'd like to um, hand over to my colleague, Ashley. She'll introduce herself uh, much better and then talk about the urban and multi-benefit drought relief. Once again, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve. And sorry, guys, as we're switching through presentations, it'll just take us a second to transition over. So, um, so as Steve said, I'm going to talk a little bit about our urban and multi-benefit drought relief solicitation. Um, my name is Ashley Gilreath. Um, I'm a program manager in the financial assistance branch. Um, so if any of you are coming to us from the IRWM world, um, you might have interacted with me on some of our Prop 1 programs. Um, but I'm part of the team that is working on the urban and multi-benefit drought relief program, um, as well as a couple other folks who are on this call. Um, so my presentation is going to be pretty short and simple. I'm actually talking about a solicitation that um, is not open yet and that the proposal solicitation package has not been released to the public yet. Um, so because of that, I'm going to have to keep to really the things that are legislatively required, the things that definitely aren't going to change um, through public comment, um, and just a basic outline of the program. Um, so first up, we're a little different than small communities, so I, I am going to just talk about our funding sources. Um, the Small Community Drought Relief Program is the same funding source, same program for a full $200 million. Um, the program we're doing is a little bit different, so it's actually coming from two different funding sources in the drought funds. Um, so we're actually combining Urban Community Drought Relief Funds, which is $100 million, with $100 million of our multi-benefit drought relief funds. Um, so in this year's budget, we actually got $200 million for the multi-benefit drought relief fund. Um, and we're going to hold part of that money back for next year. But in looking at all the different funding sources that are out there right now with drought and just how many solicitations, how many funds are coming down for groundwater, we thought, well, we don't really want to make you guys do an application for urban, an application for multi-benefit, and just keep adding solicitations on. So we're combining it all together into one solicitation this fall that'll be for $200 million. Um, 
We do have a little bit of admin, admin money in there. So about 190 of that will actually be for grants. Um, so the other benefit to doing it this way is that folks don't really have to think about like, do I qualify for urban? Do I qualify for multi-benefit? You just apply to the program and we're gonna match the projects up to the right funding source. Um, so we do have a couple of things we can share about the program. Um, one of those is the eligible applicants list. Um, this is gonna be exactly the same as small communities. This was given to us by the legislation. Um, and if you've applied to other things with us, it probably looks really familiar because it's a pretty standard list. Um, so if you're a public agency, public utility, special district, colleges and universities, mutual water companies, uh, I'm 501c3 nonprofit, um, federally recognized California Native American tribe or non-federally recognized Native American tribe that's on the California uh, Heritage Commission list, you're eligible for our funds. There's also a line in there about if you're a regional water management group, you're eligible for the funds. Um, chances are, if you're one of those groups, you already fall into one of these other categories, but there is, you know, just in case you're added on as your own um, bullet point. So essentially, if you're a public organization of some kind, you're probably going to be eligible for our funds. Um, if you have any questions about eligibility and if you're an eligible applicant, we really encourage you to definitely contact us ahead of time and, and we can chat with you about what that looks like and if we see any issues. Um, so we also have an eligible project list that's going to look exactly the same as small community. And that, again, is because it's in the legislation. Um, so if you look at the list of what we can use drought funds for, um, most of it is capital projects. We do have a couple of shorter term things we can use it for, like hauled water and bottled water. Um, under G, we also have this little add on that tells us we can use the funding for other projects that support immediate drought response. So what that means is you aren't really pinned down to just this list of projects. We can fit other things in, and I know a lot of folks have other projects they're already asking about because they don't see it reflected in this list. The key there is that it does need to be a capital project that supports immediate drought response. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about this list is if, if you're really following the legislation closely, you're probably following SB 170, which added quite a bit more money to the budget. And it also actually is going to change a couple of things about drought funding. Uh, so that legislation hasn't been signed yet. So right now we're not changing anything, but once it is signed, it's also going to make um, drought planning an eligible cost. So for folks that do have some planning needs around drought, uh, that's gonna become an eligible cost for urban communities. Um, so there's really just three other quick points that are gonna be consistent no matter um, what happens during our draft PSP. And that's that similar to small communities, we do have an expiration date on these funds. And so all projects will need to be complete by March of 2026. Um, that includes getting us your last invoicing, your last completion reports, kind of everything in so that we can make sure that we actually cut you a check and get you that check before the funds expire. Um, the next item is if, if you've had bond funding through us before, you followed some different advanced pay rules. For drought funding, we've only been approved to do up to 25%. Um, and that is if a grantee has cash flow issues. Um, and then the last item is just that all of these funds do have to be for projects with multiple benefits. Um, so just real briefly, because our PSP isn't out, I'm not gonna go over criteria or how we're gonna be ranking projects or anything like that, but I am just gonna very quickly go over our process for actually looking at the application. So you can just get a sense of what's coming down the road if you're interested in these funds. Um, so the first thing is we are looking to release a draft PSP um, within the next week or so. Uh, so that'll be out for a short public comment period. Really encourage you to check our website. Um, you can also sign up for the IRWM listserv off of our main page if you'd like, and you'll get a notification when that's released. It's gonna go out for a short public comment period because you know we are trying to get these funds out uh, quickly. And then we'll be turning around, putting out a final this fall. Pretty much as soon as we put out the final, we're gonna start taking in applications. However, it's not gonna be strictly first come first serve. Uh, we did hear from a number of folks that um, you know, they're not necessarily able to get applications together that quickly. They have some governance structures and some outreaches that they need to do with disadvantaged communities and things like that, that is very important, but also will slow down the process a little bit. So it's not gonna be strictly first come first serve, but we will start taking applications and immediately start doing completeness and eligibility review, start doing the technical reviews, and then we'll be doing awards and batches. So once we take it through and do the technical review, we'll do a batch of awards for a portion of the funding, and that's just gonna to go towards our highest priority projects. And then we'll keep all the applications we have and then keep adding to that and do another batch. And then we'll look at it again, look at who's highest priority according to our criteria and award another portion of the funding. 
Um, so that way, you know, we're trying to minimize penalizing people if, if, if you don't get an application in immediately. Um, so a couple of key things there, we are going to drop incomplete applications, um, but we'll let you know what's wrong. So you can always fix it and then resubmit it to us later. Um, and then our technical review is going to be very short. So for folks that have participated in our other programs, you're going to be used to a much longer process. We're looking to run this quite a bit faster because we are trying to be responsive to drought needs. Um, and so we'll just keep doing that process until we are out of funding, which we think, given the high amount of need from folks, is, is probably going to be early next year. Um, but you know, we'll we'll see how many applications come in. Um, so, like I said, I, this was going to be a short presentation. If you have questions, feel free to contact us. Um, we do already have folks sending us just brief project descriptions, just to see if there's any big eligibility concerns that we can tell them about without release of the draft PSP. If you want to do that, you're more than welcome to contact us and we can at least give you some basic feedback on if it fits into eligible project types and that kind of thing. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt, who's going to talk a little bit about the state um, water boards projects and funding sources. All right, good morning. Let me get the presentation pulled up here. All right, so good morning. My name is Matt Pavelcheck. I manage the Emergency Drinking Water Program with the State Water Board's Division of Financial Assistance. Um, just to briefly go over kind of a, an outline of what we're gonna be covering during our portion of the presentation today. I'm gonna to touch on some of the coordination that we've had recently with the Department of Water Resources on um, you know, funding of capital projects and then also outreach for uh, developing programs with counties. Um, some of our existing regional assistance programs that, that we currently have in place uh, in the certain areas of the state. I'm also going to touch on our urgent drinking water needs program, um, kind of eligible applicants, project types, and, and whatnot. And then <clears throat> go over the application and funding process, um, cover some of the, the typically eligible uh, costs and then uh, provide some, some resources and contact information for you guys. So uh, just wanted to briefly touch on our, our coordination and outreach efforts in partnership with the Department of Water Resources. Um, you know, we're coordinating on a, a regular basis with the Department of Water Resources to identify which types of projects are appropriate to be funded by each agency for both drought emergency response and also for long-term uh, resiliency type projects. We also uh, have been recently conducting outreach to counties regarding the funding resources available and recently held two, two webinars last month um, to uh, provide information and resources for counties that are interested in developing regional programs to assist those in need uh, within their county uh, that are impacted by, by drought. So on this slide, the, the map here shows the current regional and statewide programs that the Water Board has in place that uh, could help um, you know, domestic well users and, and state small water systems with well repair and replacement, uh, bottled drinking water, um, tanks and, and hauled water if needed. And some of these also include uh, well testing for domestic well users, and then uh, potentially also the ability to install point of use or point of entry treatment devices. Um, and then there's also some provisions for, for technical assistance. So in this map, uh, it's the same base map as the, the prior version. Um, it shows the locations of some of the more recent emergency funding requests that we've received that have been related to to drought issues. Um, funding for these projects is being very closely coordinated with the Department of Water Resources. One thing I wanted to touch on is that, um, you know, the map up here also shows the service areas of the existing programs that I, I mentioned on the prior slide. Um, as you can see, the Water Board is really well positioned within the Central Valley with our existing funding programs to provide assistance to those domestic well users and state small water systems. Um, and like I mentioned, we recently conducted webinars targeted to uh, the counties to work on developing and implementing additional programs throughout the state. As you can see on this map, it, it demonstrates the need 
to partner with with other counties and nonprofits to develop those programs to provide assistance to those that are impacted due to drought. So I just wanted to reiterate something that, that Megan touched on during the introduction and encourage um, counties or, or their nonprofit partners uh, throughout the state that are interested in implementing a program to assist those in need due to drought to uh, reach out to us to, to work on, on developing that. And we have our contact information and additional links and resources that'll be on a, a later slide as well. I also wanted to just briefly touch on kind of the, the targeted scope for those those regional programs. Um, you know, it's kind of a limitation, if you will. Um, they're really targeted towards state small water systems that are serving a disadvantaged community. So that would be less than 15 connections or, or 25 year long residents and also to um, targeted towards domestic well users that um, are located in a disadvantaged area or are um, serving a, a low income household. Um, some of our, our funding agreements do allow flexibility to respond to needs of, of smaller community water systems that are serving disadvantaged uh, a disadvantaged community, but they're really targeted more towards those state small water systems and domestic well users. Um, so what I'm going to cover next is kind of more of the, the broad application process, and this would be for um, you know those folks that aren't served by a domestic well or are not a, a state small water system. So again, in addition to um, the regional programs for those, those state small water systems and domestic well users, we can directly fund capital and interim assistance projects with uh, eligible applicants. So for our drought and urgent drinking water needs funding, the eligible applicants could include a, a public agency that serves a disadvantaged community, a tribal government that is on the California tribal consultation list maintained by the Native American Heritage Commission and is a disadvantaged community, a not-for-profit organization that is serving a disadvantaged community or a community water system that serves a disadvantaged community as well. So next, uh, I wanted to touch on some of the, the typical um, eligible projects that would be under our urgent drinking water needs and, and drought funding. Um, so we can fund uh, interim alternate water supplies such as bottled or, or hauled water, uh, emergency repairs to existing water systems uh, to ensure they're able to provide adequate water supply. That can include uh, well rehabilitation or replacement, um, emergency inner ties or consolidation type projects, installation of, of treatment systems if, if need be, uh, rented, borrowed, and, and purchased equipment, design, installation, and, and startup costs of any, any project. Um, and then these, these projects or programs are, you know, or can be implemented by nonprofits or counties to address uh, an urgent drinking water need that their community is facing. So next, our, uh, I just wanted to touch on our application process. So we, we have what's called a, an urgent drinking water needs application. It's available on our urgent drinking water needs and uh, Division of Financial Assistance drought web page under how to apply. Um, we also can provide technical assistance if need be to assist a disadvantaged community with completing an application, um, or we can lean on our partners with the Division of Drinking Water to assist in completing the application. And it, it's typically submitted directly by email to our, our general uh, email inbox that, that we have available for our, our drought funding and urgent drinking water needs funding. And there's also the ability to submit a, um, an application in our financial assistance application submittal tool or, or FAST as well. And the, the application will include uh, specific information that needs to be completed depending upon what type of project is being proposed. And I'll touch on some of that on the next slide. So just to quickly touch on what our application consists of, um, you know, we're looking at kind of basic applicant information, uh, basic information regarding the community in need, um, you know, public water system information, a uh, description of the emergency project and the, the situation that, that they're facing, um, you know, what the, the need is, um, any information about other potential funding sources, and any information about a, a longer term solution if we're only looking at kind of a, a short term emergency fix. 
um, to address that that immediate need. Um, you know, we also typically would require a, a cost estimate and a, a budget to be put together, um, financials from the water system to uh, determine any any ability to pay on, on their behalf. And then, um, you know, if it's tied to any kind of compliance order with the Division of Drinking Water, we would also want to see that as part of the, the application. I also wanted to mention that the urgent drinking water needs application does include specific instructions um, that outline any other documentation that may be a little more project specific. Um, you know, obviously there's a different uh, level of detail and need if you're applying only for um, bottled or, or hauled water funding versus what may need to be provided if you're interested in implementing a regional type funding program or, or an infrastructure project or emergency repair project and whatnot. So the application kind of breaks things down and, and you know lists out if you're interested in applying for this, make sure you include X, Y, and Z uh, to kind of make it make it easy for folks to complete the application. So next, I just wanted to touch on um, from a high level what the, the funding process looks like. Um, so you know, an applicant would, would work to develop a, a proposal and submit that to, to us for review. Um, at that point, uh, you know, our staff will review the proposal and work with the applicant to refine the scope and budget and identify if there's any additional documentation that's needed to uh, process a, a funding recommendation. Um, at that point, the staff would prepare a funding recommendation for our, our management's review and approval, and then uh, funding for the project would be approved. And at that point is when uh, eligible costs can be incurred for reimbursement, um, eventually once a, a funding agreement is executed. So once a, a project is approved, you can incur eligible costs that can be reimbursed once we, we execute a, a funding agreement. Uh, so after approval, staff would coordinate with the applicant to finalize and execute the funding, the funding agreement. And then at that point, the applicant would be able to submit reimbursement requests and progress reports for the project. And then the state would be able to process and pay reimbursements once that, that funding agreement is executed and the reimbursement request has been submitted by the applicant or grantee at that point. So I just wanted to touch on some of the uh, eligible costs that can be incurred and reimbursed with our, our funding, uh, just kind of starting with the, the general program or, or project costs. Um, you know, we're able to cover uh, personnel, which would be direct staff time that's spent on the project, um, any operating expenses uh, for the implementation of the project, such as uh, supplies or, or equipment that's needed. Uh, professionally contracted services, which would be work completed by vendors, subcontractors, or consultants. Uh, any travel that's essential for the project and, and directly related to the project. Uh, and then we can also cover indirect costs, which would be kind of non-project specific costs of doing business. Um, and those need to be very clearly broken down and, and documented in any budget that's part of a, a funding request. So next, I just wanted to touch on a couple of the uh, typically eligible costs for a few different um, types of projects. So um, if you're interested in applying for a, a bottled water project, either under a regional program or for a, a specific community in need, uh, the eligible costs would typically include the purchase and delivery of bottled drinking water. You have a maximum allocation of 60 gallons per household per month. It's typically provided in five gallon containers and we allow for one hand pump per household uh, for reimbursement. Next, I'll cover the eligible costs for a, a tanks and hauled water um, project, either under a, a regional program or for a specific community that is in need. Um, those programs can cover the purchase, delivery, and installation of temporary water storage tanks for households. Um, that would include you know, booster pumps and any electrical work that would be needed to get those uh, connected into the house and, and up and running. Uh, and then obviously the, the purchase and delivery of the hauled water as well. I wanted to just note that um, for those hauled water projects and programs, the, the water must be provided from a permitted source and must be hauled by a certified water hauler. And for any water hauling program, there's a maximum allocation of 50 gallons per person per day. 
And then finally, just wanted to touch on the typically eligible costs for a, a well repair or replacement project, either under a, a program or for a specific community in need as well. Um, so we would cover any water quality sampling or, or laboratory analysis that's needed, uh, the design of the well, any permitting or connection fees, the construction of the well, or um, you know, we could also cover uh, replacement of an existing well or rehabilitation and, and also well abandonment. Um, any distribution or conveyance pipelines, I know this is for uh, kind of a household that would be up to the point of entry for, for the household. Um, can also cover kind of hurts or, or interties, and then all of the necessary appurtenances to, to get the well into service. So what are the next steps if you want to apply? So, um, you know, we provided the link earlier to our, our application. I'm, this presentation will be shared uh, broadly, and there's several slides that have links to each of our program pages with additional information. On, on how to apply and with a link to the application. Um, our staff will coordinate with applicants, counties, and the nonprofit partners to answer any questions on the application and funding process. You know, an applicant would work uh, to develop a proposal for implementing a project or program and submit that for uh, funding consideration. And then if that is approved, we will uh, begin you know, negotiating a funding agreement and working towards implementing the project. And just the last slide here, just to have my contact information available if there are any uh, specific questions that do come up. And then there's also a link to our uh, DFA drought funding webpage on there. And with that, I believe I will hand it to Sam to discuss the CFCC funding fairs. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, thank you, everybody, for hanging in there. Um, it was a lot of information to digest. Uh, I did want to briefly put in a small plug for the CFCC funding fairs that are coming up. If you are not familiar with the CFCC funding fairs, we it's a separate organization from this, but it's kind of in the same spirit as this. It's a collaboration between several federal, state, and local agencies. And our mission is to basically get the word out about different solicitation opportunities that are coming up with our respective agencies, whether it be grants or loans or whatnot. So CFCC stands for California Financing Coordinating Committee. We are planning to attend or we are planning to hold a free fall virtual funding fair on both October 21st and 28th. They are going to be identical fairs, so you don't need to attend both. I would encourage you just to attend one. Um, so if you are seeking some funding for your infrastructure project, you know, maybe not connected directly to the drought, but if it has to do something for the drought, um, we're also putting out information about currently available funding infrastructure grants, loans, and bond fund financing programs and options. Um, this also gives you some time to connect with federal, state, and local agencies. We have a breakout session after the presentations that we encourage everybody to attend so you can get some one-on-one -on -one time with us. Um, right now, we are working on the registration. Nothing has been put out yet, but I would encourage people to keep an eye on that www.cfcc.ca.gov for more information and member directory. We will probably also put some stuff on social media, whether it be the DWR, the state board, um, Twitter, or Instagram accounts. Um, so the main idea behind these funding fairs is where it is given opportunity for attendees to speak directly with the program staff about specific projects and issues affecting their community too. Um, Again, it's going to be similar to what you're seeing here, but you're also going to be hearing about other different programs, you know, maybe not connected to the emergency drought, just some stuff coming up. So I would encourage everybody to keep an eye on that cfcc.ca.gov. And, you know, if you can plan to attend the fairs, they are from nine in the morning till two in the afternoon. So they are a little longer than this event. So, um, 
Yeah. So that is the CFCC, the California Financing Coordinating Committee. So I believe next we have Ron Miller, and he was going to give a brief um, speech on the Cal OES activities. So take it away, Ron. All right, thank you. Um, and brief it is. Uh, my presentation consists of this one single slide. So um, the important information um, that I want to convey um, is we've got two different web pages where you can get information on the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program in California. This is federal funding from FEMA that we administer here in California for hazard mitigation assistance projects. So these are any projects um, that reduce the risk of property damage or loss of life resulting from natural hazards. So if you have a project that uh, might fit in this program, I would recommend that you um, send an email to the email address provided here, hma at caloes.ca.gov, and simply request a scoping meeting. Um, we will contact you um, to, to discuss your potential project to see if it's eligible for this program. Um, all hazard types are available, um, including drought, um, but we, we have a lot of money available. Um, the Biden administration uh, made HMGP funding available for the declared COVID disaster. Um, that resulted in about $400 million of hazard mitigation grant program funding coming to California. So we have not even announced that information yet. Um, we will be announcing that funding opportunity soon and opening up a specific window to submit notices of interest for that funding. That funding um, is, is for California, so um, projects will be competing only among other California uh, projects for that HMGP hazard mitigation grant program funding. So we'll be announcing that soon. Um, you may have heard about the BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, and the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program. The difference with this program is it is an annual program. FEMA releases a notice of funding opportunity around August of each year. Um, this year it was released and it's out. And we are accepting notices of interest through September 20th. Um, we will be collecting those notices of interest uh, if it's approved, you'll receive an invitation to submit a complete sub-application that will be due to Cal OES by September 1st. So there is a very brief window of opportunity for this BRIC and FMA funding, and this funding is competitive on a nationwide basis. So um, we've got two really good opportunities here if you have hazard mitigation projects. Um, definitely contact us um, at this email address so that we can have a, a conversation to see if your potential project is eligible. Eligible entities are cities, counties, special districts, uh, state agencies. For hazard mitigation grant program, some private nonprofits are eligible. Um, now, private nonprofits are not eligible for the BRIC program. So, that's all I've got. Um, thank you very much. And um, definitely reach out to us if you have a potential project. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Ron. So moving right along with the presentation, we are now going to start a Q&A period where we can get some of your questions that have been addressed in the chat. Um, we have the program staff here. We can try to answer your questions. Uh, I did want to thank everybody for attending this morning, um, taking some time out of our busy schedules to come here. And uh, hopefully this you know, meets you with some use. Uh, we're getting some use out of this. So I believe that's the last slide. Um, I did want to share this too. Uh, we have uh, our websites 
right here, the drought, both the state board and DWR are hosting these specifically designated drought websites. So the URLs are right there. And we also have different contacts that are listed there too. If you come back, if you think of another question you have after this, uh, you're encouraged to either send the emails or we have a phone number right there. Um, yeah, so I believe that is it. But um, what I'm gonna do, uh, here I can go ahead and share this too. We also have several different resource pages. Um, we have that going on. So right now we have state board DFA, state, um, state board urgent drinking water needs. Um, I can always keep this up while we're going through the Q&A period. Maybe that'd be a good idea. So what I'm gonna do is, let's just go ahead and open the floor. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pause the share. Um, Yeah, so um, let's go ahead and start going through. Um, there are a lot of questions on the slides being available, and I do believe that they will be shared, um, but give us some time, whatnot, after our meeting here. Um, Yes, we are planning to share this PowerPoint. So uh, we are going to be posting it up um, after our webinar. Okay, uh, we do have a question on the drought proclamation. Um, uh, Ashley was going to go ahead and answer that question for everybody. So on the yeah, thanks, Sam. And I'll just, I know there's a lot of questions about the programs that are open right now. I just, I wanted to jump on this one because it's it's common to all the drought funding programs. And I saw it came up a couple of times. Um, so just one big caveat and the, and the folks from the water board can talk in more detail about this, but um, a lot of their money is not characterized as drought money in the same way that the DWR funding is. Um, so the funding that DWR received for small community, urban and multi-benefit, the total is 500 million is characterized as drought funding. And the legislation has tied eligibility to areas that are under a drought uh, proclamation, an emergency drought proclamation by the governor or a drought scenario as defined by the water board. Um, so I saw some questions in there about the eight counties that you know don't fall into that category yet. Um, I had mentioned that SB 170 is currently waiting, awaiting signature by the governor and is gonna change our programs a little bit. That's gonna be one of the big changes. So when SB 170 is signed, it'll change eligibility to all of California. Um, I did drop the link for it in the chat too, for anybody that wants to read through the details, you can see some of those small changes. And if you just wanna like hit refresh and see when it gets chaptered and signed, you can do that too. Um, but so that will change the eligibility, but until it's signed, it's still going to just be places that are under that proclamation. Um, if that doesn't fully answer the question for anybody, feel free to drop a follow-up question in the chat and I'll answer it there. And yeah, thanks, Ashley. This is Matt from the Water Board. I just wanted to quickly add that the drought funding we have, like Ashley mentioned, is um, just more, more general um, in nature. There's not a specific tie to a drought proclamation or, or any requirements along those lines. It's more just general emergency and urgent drinking water needs funding that we are making available for drought response and assistance as well. 